Okay, so let's let us commence. We are on Daf Kuf Amid Aleph. Yesterday there was a brisa that had a really funny reading of a pasuk in the Torah. The Torah, in discussing the parsha of Benos Salachad, right, where they come and they say our father had no sons; he only had daughters. So what's the protocol for inheritance? So they said, so Moshe Rabbeinu consulted with Hashem, and Hashem told him that if a man has no sons, his daughters inherit. If a man has no sons or daughters, then his brothers inherit. And if there are no brothers, then it goes to his she'ero, to the remnant of his family. And the Gemara had said, quoting a Brisa, that the word she'ero, remnant of his family, means it goes to his father. So a father, that's the source text for how we know that a father inherits his son, if the son has no other heirs. Now, the, the, the funny part of this is, is that the Brysa read this sequence in a very unusual way. And I don't have a clear resolution for the daf today, but it really requires more elucidation. Really, the, what the Brysa had said was that even though the Torah this says the sequence, no sons, daughters, no daughters, brothers, no brothers, she'ero. And the Gemara says the word she'ero means father. But you have to place that phrase of she'ero above the brothers. And so the sequence is like this. No sons, daughters. No daughters, father. No father, then brothers. And that's how the Brysa read the Pusik, and that's how we know that if a, ma- a man dies and he leaves no children, the father takes priority of inheritance over the brothers of the decedent. Okay. So that's the way, that's how we know that a father inherits his son. So that's where we're up to. It's a very strange reading. The Gemara's going to question that in a minute. So the Gemara's first question is, Ve'ema, yes? The She'ema also means wife. What, wait, 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 wait. Mr. Friedman, you know too much. Uh, right? This is Parsha. This is right. Parsha. Right. We're going to get to that in Omid Beis. That's why I say you know too much. We have to, we have to wait till we get there. So the first the Gemara says, the Ema She'ero Zeha'av. So the Gemara says, well, one second. Maybe I'll tell you that the way that you read the Pasuk is like this. Yes, She'ero means his father. Melamed She'ha'av Koydem Labas. Yachol Yaktim Leven Tamuloimar HaKarov Karov Koydem Karov Koydem. So the Gemara says, but maybe, the, if you, listen, if you're taking She'ero at the end of the Pasuk and putting it above the brothers, maybe you could put it above the daughters as well. And way, maybe the way to read the Pasuk is, is that if a man has no sons, then his father inherits him even when there are daughters. And it's only that if he has no a son and he has no father, the father's already deceased. So then you give it to the daughters, and that's how you have to read it. Okay. And how do you know that a son uh, takes priority over a father? Because a son has more kinship to a father than a father has kinship to a son. Because we know that a son acts as the surrogate of his father for many things, but very rarely does a father act as a surrogate for his son. So I'm willing to concede that when there's a father and a son, the son inherits. That's for sure. But maybe the way you read the Pasuk is that when there's a father and a daughter, the father takes priority over the daughter inheriting. So the Gemara says you can't say that. You know why? Because Kevin de Inyan Yibum Ben Ubaski Hadadi Ninhu Le Inyanachalanami Ben Ubaski Hadadi Ninhu. The Gemara says conceptually that wouldn't make sense because since with the laws of Yibum, it makes no difference whether a decedent leaves a son or a daughter. His wife does not fall for Yibum because we look at that child as the remnant of the father, as the legacy of the father. Therefore, it makes sense to say that for inheritance purposes. Um, they would come first as far as the primary legacy of the decedent. And that therefore proves that it's from a logical standpoint, you cannot look at the Pusik that way. A father could never conceptually preempt or take priority over a daughter. So the Gemara now asks the next question. Maybe I have a different way of, maybe, okay, so I can't put the father higher up on the hierarchy, but maybe he belongs further down in the hierarchy. Maybe the way you read the Pasuk is, She'ero means the father, 
but only in the absence of a son, a daughter, and brothers does a father inherit, to the exclusion of whom? And why do you need the Pasuk? To tell me that a father takes, when all of those other people are not existent, he takes priority over the uncles of the decedent, meaning his own brothers. A father, if it's a choice between a father inheriting his son or the father's brothers inheriting his son, the Torah is telling me that a father inherits over his brothers inheriting, over the uncles inheriting. Maybe that's what the Pasuk of Lishaira is coming to teach. So the Gemara says, that doesn't make any sense. Achei ha'avlo tzrichi kra. Because why? You, you wouldn't need a Pasuk to, ex- to tell me that a father takes priority over his brothers in inheriting his son. You know why? Because achei ha'av mikoach man ka'asu mikoach av. Because what would be the whole reason that an uncle would, have a, would be able to stake, a stake a claim in his nephew's Yerusha? Only because he's related through whom? Through this decedent's father, which is his brother. So, so since when would a father be alive and you would even have a havamina, you would even have a thought to think that the father's brother or brothers should inherit. So that's the end of the discussion. And that's how we know, according to this Tana, that a father in the chain of hierarchy is son, daughter, father, brother. <coughs> okay, that's the chain of hierarchy according to this Bryce. Wait a minute, says the Gemara. But you're totally taking the, the Pasuk out of sequence because the Pasuk says that only if there are no brothers does the She'iro inherit. And you're telling me that the She'iro inherits above or takes priority over the brothers. That's not what the Pasuk says. So the Gemara answers, Kroy Shalo Kisidron Ksivi. According to this Tana, the psukim are written out of sequence. It's almost like saying, Ein mukta batora. This is very difficult, and it needs to be analyzed more carefully. Now's not the time. I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to really go over this more carefully, but I just am telling you that this is very problematic. The Torah tells you a sequence. And what the Gemara is now saying is that sequence is not a sequence because it's written out of order. How Chazal know this? It's very difficult to understand. There must be other indications from other psukim that a father has greater kinship to his son than a brother has kinship to his brother. And Chazal knew this based on Misora, and they're fitting it into the Pesukim. Now, Now we've brought you one Tana who puts the father in the, in the pecking order, pecking order, pecking order, pe- pecking order, right? Son, daughter, father, brother, okay? But now we have another Brisa that learns it from a different source. Same parsha of Benos Tzalapchad, but a pasuk, a pasuk or two earlier in that parsha. Detanya, Ezu Darash Rebbe Yishmol Rebbe Yossi, Ish Ki Amus Lo, and then the, if a man dies and he has no son, the Torah says, Ve'ha'avartem es nachalaso levito. You shall pass over his inheritance to his daughter. Now, here's the, here's the crucial operative term that you need to understand for this price. All the other times the Torah says, give the inheritance to so-and-so, it uses the verb unesatem, you shall give. Only for a daughter does it say, vehaavartem, you shall pass over or transfer the inheritance to the daughter. Why is that unusual verb used if every other time the word is unesatem? That's the issue that the Bryce is undertaking now. B'makom bas and what the Torah is communicating with that word ha'avara is that we're taking it away from the rightful heir. Who is normally the rightful heir when a man dies without sons? It's his father. But because he has a daughter, take it away from the father and transfer it to the daughter. But when it talks about brothers... It doesn't use the word vahavartem, it uses the word unesatem, which means that you don't take it away from the father and give it to the brothers. If there's a father, you always give it to the father in the place of the brothers. That's how we're learning uh, from the extra from the strange verb of vahavartem. Wait a minute, says the Gemara. But maybe I'll learn that the word vahavartem means something different. Ve'ima bimakam bas atamavir nachalam in ha'achim. But maybe 
I can read the Pasuk this way. Maybe the Torah is saying, the Ha'abartem, when the rightful heirs are the brothers only, because there's no father alive anymore, then you take it away from the brothers and give it to the daughter. But if the father is alive, by inference, then you never even give it to the daughter. Maybe the way you read the Pasuk is that the father always trumps anyone other than a son. Maybe the hierarchy, based on, uh, on the way you're reading the Pasuk, is son, father, daughter, brothers. Why can't you read the Pasuk that way? So the Gemara says, In Cain, lo nichtov rachman of the ha'avartem. It says, you wouldn't, need a, you wouldn't need a Pasuk for that. The Pasuk, the Torah wouldn't need to say, the ha'avartem. Why? Because this Tana, as the Rashbams explains, learns that the, psuk, the psukim are sequential, are to be read sequential. If there's no son, give it to the daughter. If there's no daughter, give it to the brothers. Now, if the pasuk of the ha'avartem, if that verb was coming to teach me that, that you give it to a daughter over you giving it to the brothers, that's already explicit in the pasuk, because the Torah says, if there's no daughter, give it to the brothers. So clearly you see that a daughter trumps brothers. So you wouldn't have to use the word vahavartem. The ha'avartem must be telling you something that's not there in the pasuk, and therefore it's telling you that if there's no uh, if there's no son, you give it to the daughter over the person who's not mentioned in this pasuk, which is the father, because he's the next in line in the pecking order after the daughter, and that's how I know that the sequence is son, daughter, father, brothers. That's the end of this price. So the Gemara now says, Ulaman my So the Gemara now says, okay, according to this latter Tana, what does the word She'ero mean? So mi boy tanya. The word She'ero is for another halacha. She'ero zu ishto. Okay, so... By the Koyan, by the Koyan it's mentioned. So M- Mr. Friedman was correct. He, he knew this Gemara. So he says, She'ero zu ishto. That the word She'er means a person's wife. And what does this teach me? The word she'er in the context of inheritance teaches me, okay. this teaches me that a husband inherits his wife. If a husband survives his wife, then he uh, inherits her assets. Now, if you learn it, it, now what about the other brisa, which uses the word she'ero as the text? What does he do with the word va'avartem? So mi boy lechidatani, he uses it for a different halacha. Like the Bryce says, Rebbe Omer, the kula nemar bahen nesina, the ka nemar nemar bahen ha'avara. She'en lecha shemavir nachla mishevet l'shevet, el abas ho'el ubana ubala yorshin osa. It's for a special din. It's to tell me that the only time that you can ever transfer real estate from one shevet to another shevet is through abas. That's why the word. That's right. That's why the word ha'avartem is used in the context of a daughter. It's to tell me that would be the only time, and this is a very important halacha. Normally, you're not allowed to transfer real estate from one shevet to another shevet. There's only one exception: when a daughter owns property that she inherited from her father, and then she dies. If she was married to a member of another shevet then the land that she owned will be transferred to either her husband, who survives her, or her son, who survives her, because he's also from another shaven. And that's what that word vahavartim is teaching me, <coughs> not the other thing. Now, umimai desheiro zeha'av. Let's go back to the previous b'risa. You told me that the word she'ero means father. And like Mr. Friedman said, we have the word she'er means other things in the Torah. Because dechziv she'er avichahu. But no, because the Torah says the, uh, the, associates the word she'er because it says do not um, uh, have uh, a, no, any carnal knowledge of your father's wife. And why, says the Torah? Because she is the relationship of your father. The word she'er is associated with the word father. But But maybe I'll tell you that the word she'er could also mean a mother, which teaches me that a mother could inherit her son as well. And we know that that's not the halacha, right? Uh, because after all, the Torah says, do not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, your aunt, because she is the she'er of your mother. So you see that she'er is associated with mother as well. So, Omar Rava, Omar Kra, osa. 
Mishpachas av kruya mishkruya mishpacha, mishpachas aim eno kruya mishpacha. So the Gemara answer is, I'll tell you why. Since the Pasuk of inheritance talks about mishpacha, that you, you inherit from your mishpacha, a woman's family is not called mishpacha. Your mother's family is not called mishpacha. Try telling that to your wife, right? <laughs> right? But this is for halachic purposes, not for, not for a kinship and, and, and loving relationships purposes. It's for halachic purposes. For halachic purposes, the word mishpacha only applies to the paternal uh, relations, not to the maternal relations. And that's how I know that the Torah cannot be conveying to me that a mother inherits her son because it says me mishpachta. You only inherit from mishpacha. As it says, the word mishpacha is associated to the vase avos, to the, to the paternal tribal family, and not to the maternal family. So, frek the Gemara, now we're going to see some agadita. You mean to tell me that a mother's family is not called mishpacha? This is a Pasuk from Sefer Shoftim. Now, remember, Sefer Shoftim talks about a time in Jewish history that we're not particularly proud of for most of the history. It was a pretty, anar- uh, it was a, anarchy was reigning. It was a pretty violent period of time in our Jewish history. A lot of bad things happened because we really didn't have proper leadership. And we don't shy away from the facts of our history. We acknowledge it. And we learn from our mistakes. One of the big mistakes was the episode of Pesel Micha. What was the story of Pesel Micha? In the portion of Ephraim, there was a guy from Shevet Dun who decided to make a pestle out of silver. And he figured, listen, if I have an idolatry, I need a shrine. And if I have a shrine, I need a minister, a priest, to work in the shrine to service the idolatry. So one day, there's this traveling young man who bumps into Micha, and he says, Ah, oh, I want to make you the Kohen for my Avodah Zarah. And the Pasuk describes this young man, who will later learn his name is Yehonasan, but we'll see. It says he was a young man from Beis Lechem Yehuda, from the family of Yehuda, and he was a Levi. And he was living there with Micha. Now, the question is, there's a contradiction here in the Pasuk. You tell me he's from the tribe of Yehuda, and you tell me that he's a lady. <coughs> you can't be both. So the Gemara says, Agufa Kasha, that in and itself is a, a contradiction. Amart mi mishpachas Yehuda, amma mi Yehuda asi. Vahaksi vahu levi, amma mi levi asi. He says, on the one hand, you're telling me he's from Yehuda, so he's a Judean. But on the other hand, you're telling me he's a Levite. So which one is it? So El Alav, the Avu ami levi, the ime mi Yehuda, ukama mi mishpachas Yehuda. You have to say, that the reason why is because he was a Levi, but his mother was from Yehuda. So, and yet you see the Torah, the, the Pasuk calls him Mishpachas Yehuda. So the word Mishpacha does apply to a mother, a mother's family. A contradiction to what you just said. So the Gemara says, Omar Rava bar Chanan, lo, Gavra Dishmei Levi. No, he really was not a Levi. He was really from his father, he was from Yehuda. And his name happened to be Levi. A lot of guys whose name is Levi and they're not a Levi, that was his name. So the Gemara says, but that, that doesn't fit into the story. Because, So the Gemara says, but what does the Pasuk say? Micha says, ah, this is Bashert, that you should, I should meet you at this time when I need a priest for my Avodah Zarah. Because Hashem has sent me a man from the tribe of Levi, and the tribe of Levi are priests. So if he's not a Levi, then what Micha said doesn't make any sense, right? So the Gemara says, no, in the Isrami le Gavra Dishme Levi. No, what, what Micha was saying is, is it's, it's serendipitous that your name is Levi, even though you're not you're a, a Ben Yehuda, but the fact that your name is Levi is a simon from Shemayim that Hashem wants this to happen, that you should be the priest of my Avodazar. Which all goes to show you that people who say that something is bashert because they come up with some strange uh, connection don't always believe them, right? It doesn't always mean that it's min shemayim just because his name is so-and-so, right? Sometimes it could be, but sometimes it's not, okay? So frak the Gemara, v'chi levi shemo, v'halo yahonasan shemo, shenamar v'yahonasan ben gershom ben menasha hu v'na'uvanav ha'yu kohanim l'shevet hadani. So wait a minute, it says later on in that same story 
that the name of the priest that was working in Micha's shrine for his Pesel, for his idolatry, was named Yehonasan, the son of Gershom, the son of Menashe. Now, I looked up this Pasuk early this morning, and I want you to know that there are two versions in this Pasuk. Our Mas- Masoret is that it's Yehonasan ben Gershom ben Menashe. But in certain Christian editions, and in also the Septuagint editions, it's listed as Yehonasan ben Gershom ben Moshe. Not ben Menashe, but ben Moshe. And as we will see, this fellow Yehonasan was Moshe Rabbeinu's grandson. It's a shand and a cherpa that, the pasa, that we should know that Moshe Rabbeinu's grandson was a priest for Avodah Zarah. It's an embarrassment. But it all goes to show you that you can take care of your own yichas, but you can't take care of your children's yichas. Whatever they end up doing, it's got nothing to do with you. You do your best job, and whatever happens, happens. We know even great gedolim of, the, of our own lifetimes have had children or grandchildren that went off the derech, or did not, were not faithful to the faith. So, what? Esav. Esav, too, right? All right, so it happens. It happens even in the best of families. It even happened to Moshe Rabbeinu. So as you'll see, the Gemara, even though the Gemara's version of the Pasuk is that he was Ben Menashe, the grandson of Menashe, but the Gemara will acknowledge that his name was really Moshe, and the Pasuk changed the name. Are you saying that the Emes is the way the Goyim have written? No, I'm telling you that the Emes is, is that he really was Moshe Rabbeinu's grandson, as you'll see in a minute. What the correct text in the Pasuk is according to what the Gemara has, that it calls him Ben Menashe. You'll see why in just a second. V'chi Ben Menashe hu v'alo Ben Moshe hu. The Gemara says, what do you mean? Why are you calling him Ben Menashe? We know for a fact that he was Moshe's grandson, not Menashe's grandson. So d'chsiv b'nei Moshe Gershom v'Eliezer. Because Gershom, whose Yehonasan's father is Gershom, and we know that Gershom was Moshe's son, not Menashe's son. So ela mitoch sha'asa ma'isa menashe tzlo akasuf b'menashe achanami mitoch sha'asa ma'isa menashe da'asim mi Yehuda tzlo akasuf b'Yehuda. So the answer is really he was a levi, and you can't prove from here that a mishpacha goes after the mother, because he really had nothing to do with Shevet Yehuda, just like he had nothing to do with Menashe. Menashe was an evil king who came from Yehuda, and he was an idolatrous king. He would who would not live for several centuries hence. And what the Pusik was alluding to is that this poor fellow Yehonasan in some way adopted the guise and the attitudes of someone who would live after him, the, the notorious Menashe who came from the Shevet of Yehuda. And that's the only reason why the Pusik attributes him to Menashe, and it's the same reason why the Pusik attributes him to Yehuda. Not because his mother was from Shevet Yehuda, but because he imitated or emulated the same mistakes that Menashe of the tribe of Yehuda did. That's what the Gemara, that, that says the Gemara is what the Pasuk is communicating. Amar Rabbi Yochanan Mishum Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, Mikan Shetolan Esakal Kola B'mekulkal. From here we see that sometimes we will create an association even when no association exists in reality because two people were corrupt in the same way. So we say that this person is corrupt because he's connected to that other corrupt person, even though they may have lived in completely centuries apart. Rabbi Yossi bar Chanino Amar Mehacha, vegam hu tov toar me'od, v'oso yolda acharei avshalom. Rabbi Yossi says, you can learn it from this Pasuk as well. In Sefer Shmuel, it talks about, uh, Malachim, sorry, it talks about Adoni Yahu. Adoni Yahu was David's son, who created a rebellion and wanted to take the Malucha from Shlomo after David died. And it says that he was very a uh, handsome man, and his mother gave birth to him after Avshalom. And that, that doesn't make any sense. We know that they had different mothers. Adoniyah's mother was named Chagit, and Avshalom's mother was named Ma'achas. So what does it mean that his mother gave birth to him after Avshalom? So Elam Avshalom demarud b'malchus lo Avshalom. The answer is. The Pasuk makes an association because Adoniyahu had the same uh, uh, mistaken traits as Avshalom. And it was the same arrogance and, and the fact that he was good-looking and he, he was full of himself, the same way Avshalom was, that was the same traits that made Adoniyahu create the rebellion as well. Skip the parentheses. Amar of Elazar, la'olam yidbak adam b'toivim shaharei Moshe shenasa bas yisru yatsum yimena yahonasan, aharon shenasa bas aminadav, Yatsumimenu Pinchas. 
So Rabbi Lazar says a person should always attach himself to good families that have yichas. Why? Because the reason why Moshe's grandson turned out to be Yahona's son is because he married an idolater's daughter. Even though Yisra was a very righteous man, so much so that a Parsha is named after him, but the fact that he had idolatry in his family was really ultimately the cause that Moshe's grandson went off the derech. Whereas by contrast, Aharon, who married a woman of righteous stock, his grandson was Pinchas, the great Pinchas, who became the Kohen Gadol eventually. So for the Gemara, wait a minute, Pinchas Labni Yisro Asi? Pinchas also is descended from the same Yisro, because Vahaksiv, Elazar, Ben Aaron, Lok Achlom, Bibinos, Putiel, Loli Isha, the Torah and Parshas Vaera, tells me that even though Aaron married Bat Aminadav, but his son Elazar, Pinchas's grandfather, Pinchas's father rather, married from the daughters of Putiel. Who, are, who is Putiel? Our Misora is, is that Putiel is another name for Yisro. And why was he called Putiel from the word Lefatein? That he fattened calves for idolatrous purposes. So if anything, Pinchas is even closer related to Yisro than Yehonah's son is. So my love, da'asi mi Yisro shepitim ha'golam la'avodazara. Isn't that what it means? So the Gemara says, no. Lo, the asi mi Yosef shepit beit be Yisro. Really the meaning of the Pasuk of Putiel the name is that he came from Yosef, that he was descended from Yosef. And the word putiel does not come from the word lefatein, but rather comes from the word lefatfeit, which means to belittle the Yetzir Hara, that, that Yosef succeeded in conquering, vanquishing his Yetzir Hara, and that's why his daughter is, or his granddaughter, is known as putiel. And therefore, Pinchas comes from completely righteous stock. So, Frek the Gemara... But that doesn't fit in the well-known story that we have in our Masorah, in our Torah Shabbat Peh, that says that after Pinchas killed Zimri, who was the head of the tribe of Shimon, they said, what a chutzpah this guy has, that he's descended from someone who fattened calves for Avodah Zarah, that he should go ahead and take it upon himself to kill the head of a tribe. So you see that he is descended from Yisra. So the Gemara's final answer is, Ela i avua di'ime mi Yosef, ima di'ime mi Yisro, i avua di'ime mi Yisro, ima di'ime mi Yosef. So the Gemara says, you have to say that he's descended both from Yosef and from Yisro. And therefore the way it works is like this. His mother's name was the daughter of Putiel. That implies both Yisro and Yosef. So either his mother's a father was descended from Yosef, and his mother's mother was descended from Yisro, or his mother's father was descended from Yisro, and his mother's mother was descended from Yosef. And that's implied from the words benos putiel. And the Rashbam says that that implies that it's more than one puti. And where do you see that? Either because the extra yud in the word putiel, or it says mibinot putiel in the plural, which implies that there's more than one derivation for the name Putiel, not just one. So it's both Yisro and Yosef. So the Rashbam explains as follows. The Rashbam says, but we're still left with a question. If both Pinchas and Yehonasan came from Yisro, why does the Gemara's teaching still hold that it's because of bad Yichus, Yehonasan became an idolater? Pinchas had the same bad Yichus, and he still became Pinchas. So how do you... Re- children, they're talking about the children, not them no. So that your children will remain. No. Why should marry? No, 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 no. Pinchas is equally descended from Yisro as Yehonah's son. The Gemara's lesson was, Moshe's mistake was, he married Yisro's daughter, and that's why he had a grandson that went off the derech. But wait a minute, Elazar married Yisro's daughter or granddaughter, and he, his kid didn't go off the derech. So how do you reconcile it? Right? It's, 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 it's apples and apples. So the Gemara's answer is, that, no, he came from both Yisro and Yosef. So there's, I'll give you two approaches, one of the Rashbam and one of Tosfos. The Rashbam says, with Yehonas and it's three generations, and with Pinchas it's four generations, so therefore it's not as bad. In other words, yes, you should try to marry a girl from good Yichus, but realize you're taking a risk, but by the fourth generation things will be okay. And you see that from, from Pinchas. 
The other answer that Toysvus brings is that the difference between Yehonasan and Pinchas is that it was through Yehonasan's father's side, because his father was Gershom, that he had this bad um, seed lineage, and that's why he went off the derech. And Pinchas's lineage came from, bad lineage came from his mother's side. And the mother infuses less harmful effects into a child than a father's side. And that's the difference. What are you supposed to make of this Gemara? I have a different teretz, from, different from the Rashbam and different from Tosus, and I'll be a, a, chutz, a, a mechutzah, and I'll tell you my teretz. My teretz is, is that sometimes it's not true. Sometimes you could marry a girl who comes from a very corrupt family, and your kids will still be tzaddikim. Look at example, look at, uh, look at, look at Rachel and Leah, <laughs> right? And so, yes, is yichus an important criterion? This whole exercise is telling us yes. It is an important criterion because sometimes something can pass through the generations through no fault of yours. You, try, you gave your child whatever you could. And Nebuch, what happened was some shemets of something in the past got passed down and is beyond your control. That's your consolation. It's not your fault. But guess what? If you find an amazing girl, don't turn her away because of the yichus. Because guess what? Even from the daughters of Yisro can come a pinchas. That's my terence. Have a good day.